uh, hello class, good afternoon, good afternoon class, and uh, welcome back. So we will have our lecture session today, a one hour uh, review of the operating system support lecture videos that you watched yesterday. Okay, so before we start our review of these uh, operating system support materials, let's uh, take your attendance first. Okay, attendance is very good. All right, uh, Brenda. Brenda, all right, uh, Supian, Tan Supian, okay, Chia Tai Siu, Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing, Chua Yu Yang, okay, uh, Ernest, Ernest, Go Kian Sing, Go Kian Sing, Hu Hing Tong, all right, Ku Bun Kiong, Ku Bun Kiong, Ku Kian Sing is here, Ku Bun Kiong is here, uh, okay, Lao Lok Jing. How long team? Lee Zilin. Lee Zilin. Uh, Lim Chun Wei. Lim Chun Wei. Lim Wen Yang. Okay. Lim Yong Chuan. Lim Yong Chuan. Long Yao Ting. Good afternoon. Lo Tiong Lia. Okay. Lu Jui Min. Right. Ng Han Xiang. Ng Han Xiang. Ng Wei Hong. Ong Mei Lin. Hong Shui Wen, Hong Shui Wen, right? Kwa Yi Han, So Yen Cheng, Han Xin Shen, Han Xin Shen, Tio Liang Ho, Tio Liang Ho, Tio Yi Si, right? Uh, Wong Chong Yi, Wong, oh, Han Xin Shen is here, Wong Chong Yi, Wong Ka Xing, Wong Ka Xing, uh, Yong Wing Liang, right? Yong Si Ye, Yong Si Ye, okay. Check again. Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing, uh, Hu Hing Dong, Hu Hing Dong. Okay. Uh, Li Zilin, Li Zilin, Li Zilin, Lim Chun Wei, Lim Chun Wei. Okay. Uh, okay. Wong Ka Xing, Wong Ka Xing, are you here? Wong Ka Xing. Okay. I'll check your attendance again uh, later. Now, um, operating system support. So this uh, this chapter, uh, this chapter, uh, week ten uh, lecture notes. Uh, now this is the most, this is the most important part of uh, this subject. Okay, this subject. Uh, this is the most important chapter. Why le? Why is this the most important chapter le? Because uh, Everything that you have studied up until now uh, will be integrated together, right? The first six weeks of this subject, you learn about the Cortex M processor architecture, right? The first uh, six weeks, you learn about the Cortex M processor architecture, and then week seven, eight, nine, you learn about operating systems. Okay, so now, uh, uh, chapter ten, uh, week ten, uh, you will see uh, how. The Cortex M architecture is designed to support operating systems, right? Because operating systems are need to control hardware. So, if the hardware is designed to support operating systems, uh, then it will be very easy to write your operating system code. Now, easy is just a nice word. The more specific word would be very efficient, okay? Because microcontrollers have limited resources. Why they have limited resources is because you need to manufacture them at low cost with very low power consumption. Microcontrollers are supposed to run with very little power and they need to be very cheap. And because of that, uh, thus they have a lot of limitations in their resources, in the processor's uh, performance, processing speed, in the amount of memory you have available. Okay, so because of all these limitations in the microcontroller hardware, you cannot simply write your code. Your code needs to be optimized, right? written to be as efficient as possible in controlling the hardware. So, of course, uh, if the hardware is not friendly, then it's very difficult. Uh, but Cortex-M processors, the hardware is designed to be very operating system friendly. Right? The hardware is designed to be very friendly to operating system developers. So what, how is it friendly? Uh, there are six main concepts, uh, 
six main concepts in your Cortex M processor architecture that supports the implementation of operating systems. So we will look at these six items. Up. But uh, I don't think we can finish all six today. So I will discuss control stack and SysTick today and the MPU SVC pen SV next week. Okay, but before that, uh, okay, uh, Wong Ka Sing is here. Li Zilin is here. Okay, and one more. Chu Zhang Hing. Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing. No, ah, uh? okay. Coming back. So, uh, we have these six. We have these six principles. Ah, uh, six. Uh, not principles. Ah, uh, six. Uh, architectural. Uh, properties. Properties of the architecture. Now, the first one is the control register. The first one uh, is the control register. Now, you have heard of the control ma register many times already, but maybe you do not appreciate the real purpose of it because uh, early on you haven't learned about operating systems yet. But now once you know about operating systems, uh, you can appreciate the role that the control register play. Okay? What does the control register do? The con control register only got two bits. Bit zero uh, is to select privilege. Bit zero is to select privilege. Okay, what do we mean by privilege? Right? Privilege means uh, um, access to system resources. Okay, you, you learned in your uh, memory, uh, microcontroller memory, all the important registers, uh, they are in the system region. All the important uh, registers of your microcontroller, uh, all the important registers of your microcontroller, they are here in the this part here, the system region. Okay, this part here. This is where all your important uh, important registers are located, this place, the system region. Okay, all the registers are to control the interrupts, the timer, the system control block, processor operation, all of them are here. So this part of the memory is very important. You don't want to let anyone simply access. Okay, you don't want to let simply anyone to access this part of memory. So how we protect this part of memory? By requiring a privilege to access. Okay, so in order to access this part of memory, oh, when you are executing code, oh, your control register bit zero needs to be zero. Okay, privilege means that your control register bit zero is zero. Unprivileged means control register bit zero is a one. So this bit, uh, if zero means you got privilege, one means you got no privilege. So when do you have privilege? When do you not have privilege? We very easily classify them. Uh, when you are running operating system code, you have privilege. That means when you are running operating system code, control register bit zero should be zero. When you are running user thread code, user application code, uh, user thread code, uh, control register bit zero should be a one. This is how we use it. Okay, so when you are running operating system code, the control register bit zero should be a zero. When you are running user threads, user code, uh, control register bit zero is a one. Right? Why? This is just to protect this part of memory. So only the operating system uh, can access uh, this part of memory, right? Threads cannot. Why is it so dangerous for threads? Uh? You know your operating system runs on system ticks, right? Threads, uh, if they disable the system timer, uh, then your whole operating system crash already. Uh. Uh, so that's why uh, we don't let uh, threads uh, access this part of memory. So we use privilege, uh? okay? So that's the main idea about privilege. Now. How about control register bit one? Control register bit one, no, you see, uh, control register bit one no, is to select the stack pointer, S P S E L, stack pointer select, stack pointer select. Okay, so uh, control register bit one, uh, this bit, uh, if it's a zero, means you, you, you are using main stack, you are using main stack, you are using the main stack pointer. MSP, main stack pointer. If this bit is a one, means you're using the process stack pointer, PSP. Okay, so you see, uh, 
when you access the stack pointer, right? When you access the stack pointer, uh, stack pointer, where is the stack pointer? Where is the stack pointer? The stack pointer is located uh, here. This is your stack pointer, R13. You see, your, your uh, CPU, uh, you know your CPU got uh, 16 registers. This is all 16 registers of your CPU, okay? The stack pointer is register number 13, R13, that's the stack pointer. So uh, whenever you access the stack pointer, uh, whenever you access the stack pointer, uh, for example, when, when do we use the stack pointer? When do we use the stack pointer? For example, it's when you do something like this. You know, when you when you push something into the stack, let's say you, you say push R1, uh, then uh, the contents of R1 will go into the stack, right? Where does it go into the stack? At wherever the stack pointer is pointing. Wherever the stack pointer is pointing. So this stack pointer, this stack pointer, you see this stack pointer. Is this the main stack pointer or is this the process stack pointer? Ah, now you see, we actually got two stack pointers. Where you, your stack pointer, your stack pointer, right? Okay. This stack pointer, is it the main stack pointer? Or is it the process stack pointer? So you actually got two stack pointers, the main stack pointer and the process stack pointer. But when you say push R1, so the contents of R1 goes into the stack at where the stack pointer is pointing. This stack pointer, is it main stack pointer or process stack pointer? Ah, so this is where you refer to the control register, control register bit one. So control register bit one, if it's a zero means you are using the Main stack pointer. Okay, and the control register, the control register, bit one, if it's a one, means you are using the process stack pointer. Okay, so why why do I need two stacks? Uh? Main stack pointer and process stack pointer. Why do I need two stacks? This is because uh, we need to separate the memory of the operating system and user tracks. User tracks uh, use the process stack. Okay, so if this is your memory, la, if this is your memory, uh, so this part of memory, let's say, uh, this is the main stack, right? The main stack uh, is used by the operating system. Okay, the main stack is used by the operating system. Then here, uh, you got the, this is the, let's say uh, process stack is here. I don't know where it is. Uh, it depends on uh, your linker, where it places all this. Uh, so we don't know, right? There are some rules where this will be placed. Uh. So this is your process stack. Uh, and your process stack is used by, used by the threads, used by threads, uh, process stack, uh, used by threads. So uh, the main stack is pointed by the MSP and the process stack uh, is pointed by the PSP, right? It's, so you see, we, we actually have two, two different uh, stack pointers. So when you push R1, the contents of R1 goes into the stack. Does it go into here or does it go here? Does it go to the main stack or does it go to the process stack? Then we have to look at the control register. So this is what the control register does. The control register uh, selects the stack pointer so that when you push something into the stack, you can select whether it goes into the main stack or the process stack. So whenever the operating system is running, uh, it will use the main stack. That means control register one is zero. Whenever user threads are running, whenever user threads are running, there will place their data inside the process stack. That means when user threads are running, uh, the control register bit one is a uh, one. Okay, so this is the idea. So we separate memory. What is the purpose of separating memory? Uh? So uh, the threads and the operating system memory is not mixed up. What is the advantage of not mixing them up? If one of the threads uh, got an error, the operating system can simply terminate that thread just terminate that track, remove all its memory contents and restart it. 
without affecting the operating system or other threats for that matter. Because you see, uh, actually, uh, the process stack right, is not one. The process stack, uh, you, you can have many, depending on how many threats that you have. So maybe uh, this is for threat one. This is the process stack for threat two. This is the process stack for threat n, depending on how many threads you have. So this is PSP for threat one. This is the PSP for threat two. This is the PSP for threat three. Okay. So the operating system uh, just need to change the process stack pointer value. If the process stack pointer value is pointing here, we are when we use threat one now. Uh, you just set the process stack pointer to point here. You know you can change the process stack pointer value. Man. When you're running, when the operating system is running track one, no, right, it will just change the PSP to point here. When track two is running, PSP will change to point here. When track N is running, PSP will change to point here. Right? And, and so on. So how is this concept look like? Eh? Okay, let me show you uh, how this concept looks like. So come down here how does this concept look like okay it looks like this okay this diagram is uh, this diagram is very important if you understand this diagram then you know uh, how uh, how uh, the stack is used push this, pull this down a little bit okay, 240 should be nice okay 240 is just nice. All right. So if you look at this diagram, no, this is your uh, memory address, okay, going upwards, right? You see the address is going upwards. So this is the higher address and this is the lower address. Lah. Okay, and this is RAM. Ah. You know that your stack is placed inside SRAM. Okay, so this is your RAM. <clears throat> now, first of all, when you turn on the microcontroller, when you turn on the microcontroller, uh, hold on, one second. Okay, I'm back. Now, um, when you turn on the microcontroller, right? By default, uh, when you turn on the microcontroller by default, the main stack pointer is used by default uh, when you turn on the microcontroller. Okay, so the first time you turn on the microcontroller. Startup and initialization. Startup code. Uh, right? You initialize, you turn on the mail controller, it starts up. So by default, uh, the main stack pointer is used. Okay. So and you know what the stack is for. Uh, the stack is to store local variables. So the the your main function, uh, your main your your main function, the first function that runs. So your main function might have some local variables. So those local variables will be stored into the stack. So as you use the stack, you put things into the stack. The stack usage grows up. You see, it grows downwards, huh? Because this is the top of the stack. Stack is empty, man. When you put things into the stack, it will grow downwards. So your main function starts running. You put uh local variables that you declare in the main function into the stack, so it grows downwards. It's downwards, okay. And then, uh, up until this point, now the operating system has finished initializing. Ready? The operating system, huh? switches so you create three three tasks or three threads uh, a b and c okay. so first of all you run a you switch to a so when you switch to a uh, what happens is uh, what happens is uh, you will switch the stack pointer from main stack you will now use the process stack and you set the process stack pointer uh, with to point to here okay so Class A stack pointer is initialized. So the stack pointer points here now. Points here now. So it points here. Uh, okay. And then as task A starts running, uh, as task A starts running, uh, it will start to use the stack. Okay, you put things into the stack, and then maybe something gets loaded out and then goes into the things get pushed into the stack until this point. So at this point, uh, now we will perform context switching. Context switching means we need to switch from task A to task B. Okay, so task A, all is CPU register values, all 16, uh, all 16, all 16 registers, all 16 CPU registers used by task A is going to get saved into its stack. 
So save everything already. <clears throat> That's what we mean by context switching. Context refers to the 16 CPU registers, their values used by task A. Before you switch to task B, you need to save them first so that afterwards a task A can resume correctly. So you save ready. And then context switching uh, is performed by the operating system. So you notice the operating system here uh, performs, the operating system uses a little bit of the stack here because it is running the task manager to perform context switching. Once context switching has completed, then the CPU will now switch to task B. So now you notice uh, task B, uh, its uh, stack pointer is pointing here. So when task B starts to run, it will start to use its stack. It will create local variables, store it into the stack, and then maybe free up some memory, use some memory. So until here, at this point now, task B uh, uh, needs to be switched to task C. Right? So task B, the stack pointer is saved, and then the operating system runs again, and the task manager runs again. Now it will decide, okay, who is supposed to run next? Task C, or, okay, switch to task C. So we switch to task C. The stack pointer is now pointing here to the process stack used by task C. Then task C starts to run until at the end, task C, uh, at the end of its time slot already. So task C need to save its CPU register values. And then we switch back to task A. And before we run task A, uh, before we run task A, we need to restore all the CPU registers used by task A. Okay. So it's basically, uh, you restore the CPU registers, run the task until the end of its time slice, you save its CPU registers, and then you switch to the next task, restore the CPU registers of the next task, run until the end of its time slice, save its CPU registers, and so on. So this is how we keep switching. right? And the, the, the who performs the context switching? Uh, it's the operating system. So when you see the operating system is running here to perform uh, context switching. Okay, so this uh, is the concept of how um, <clears throat> the control register and the stack is used. So I hope now it's clear to you, uh, the control register got two bits, one bit to select privilege, right? Control register got <clears throat> two bits, one bit to select, uh, where is the, let me go back to the first slide. <clears throat> Control register got two bits. The first bit is to select privilege. So operating system, when it's running, it has full privilege. When thread code is running, thread code has no privilege. Okay. So when operating system is running, control register bit zero is a zero. When thread code is running, control register bit zero is a one. Okay. So that's bit zero. Now bit one uh, is to select the stack pointer. So when the operating system is running, uh, control register bit one is zero. So uh, main stack is being used, right? Main stack is being used. When the operating system is running, OS, when the operating system of OS is running, control register bit zero is a zero. So using main stack, okay? When the user threads are running, uh, control register bit one uh, becomes a one. So process stack is selected. So when user threads are running, they use the process stack. We separate the memory usage to allow the operating system to terminate or remove the memory used by threads if uh, you don't need them anymore, free up the memory without affecting itself because it uses a different part of memory. Okay, all right. So uh, just now that, that diagram uh, is something, a simpler form is similar is here. So this is, for example, uh, this is the main stack, All right? This is the main stack. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, and a little bit here, All right? So this is the main stack. Now the main stack, uh, first of all, you use it to store the startup code, startup code, All right? This is the variables uh, in your main function, your main.c, uh, the first function. Uh. So that's your startup. Uh. So it stores some local variables here. Okay. Now the operating system, uh, when you start the operating system, right? When you start the operating system, uh, the, the operating system starts running. Uh, what do we mean by the operating system starts running? Where is the operating system code? Okay. The operating system code uh, is all placed into three exceptions. Now this is very important. Uh. 
all your operating system code, right, is placed uh, in three system exceptions. The pendable supervisor call, the supervisor call, and the system timer. All operating system code are inside these three exception handlers. Okay, they're inside these three exception handlers. Okay, so uh, uh, after you run your main function already, or the main function will start the kernel, right? Once the kernel starts running, uh, it is basically the systic timer. You are basically running uh, the systic handler, right? Every time the systic interrupt happens. So if you set the systic interrupt to one millisecond, if you set the systic interrupt to one millisecond, that means every one millisecond there is a systic interrupt, right? So your operating system uh, will run every one millisecond. What happens when the operating system run? It will switch the tracks, right? And or it will do some uh, housekeeping function, uh, like for example, uh, uh, OS delay. OS delay is in terms of system tick. Uh. So let's say uh, track one uh, OS delay of 10. Track one, uh, you use the OS delay of 10. So every time the system handler runs, you will check, oh, track one is in, in OS delay is waiting. Uh. So it's 10. Uh. Now system, so the in the system handler, when it runs, it will decrement the value from 10 become nine. So the next time it runs, it will decrement again, nine become eight and so on. So the system handler, besides um, switching between tracks, uh, it will also keep track of the the tracks are in a uh, waiting state and update their state. Uh. Okay, the SVC and the pen SV, uh, these two exceptions, uh, they are, uh, this is where you place all your RTOS function coding. What, what, what do we mean by the RTOS function coding? Remember last week we learned about the, last week and the week before that, you learned about the RTOS API functions. You got the functions to create tracks, to create virtual timers, to create inter-track communication objects, message queues, semaphore, signals, all those functions. Are, where, where are they located, their code? Their code are all in SVC and PanSV. They are all inside here, their code. So when you execute a function like OS semaphore set or OS semaphore wait or OS semaphore release, you execute things like that. Uh, you are actually uh, uh, triggering SVC functions. You know, you're actually triggering SVC functions because you know uh, your track got no privilege. Man. Track got no privilege, right? So when the track execute OS semaphore release, but the semaphore uh, is a uh, operating system object. Okay, so the track should not access the operating system object, and it cannot because tracks don't have privilege. Tracks don't have privilege, so the track execute OS semaphore release. It releases the semaphore, but it cannot go and access the semaphore man, because it doesn't have privilege. Man. So how do you do something that requires privilege when you don't have it? And this is where SVC comes along. Okay, supervisor call. Supervisor call allow threads without privilege to request the operating system to do something for it that requires privilege. And the operating system can do it. Why? Because the operating system code is all placed in these three exception handlers. And you know, exception handlers always have privilege. Okay? When you are running exception handler code, when your processor is running some interrupt service routine or some exception handler, right? it is in handler mode. And when the processor is in handler mode, now, now handler mode is nothing special. A handler mode is just a way of saying the processor is running an exception handler now. Okay, there's nothing special about the word handler mode. Now. It's just to describe that where the processor is in now. If the processor is running user code, we say the processor is in thread mode. If the processor is running uh, interrupt service routines, we say the processor is in handler mode. Okay. And when your processor is in handler mode, it always have privilege. That is why the processor, uh, the operating system uh, always have privilege so it can do all those stuff that requires privilege. Okay, so, all right. This is, this is so this uh, is the uh, 
space uh, where you store all the variables, local variables used by PanSV, Sysdig, and SVC. These three system exceptions, they are all stored here. Okay? And then, uh, and then, uh, now, interrupts, right? Interrupts uh, are given higher priority than these three guys. Okay? Interrupts are, uh, uh, your microcontroller peripheral interrupts. Hyper interrupt, ADC interrupt, serial port interrupt, GPIO interrupt, all those microcontroller peripheral interrupts, uh, they have higher priority than your operating system. Why? Uh? Because when the interrupts are triggered, uh, you need to respond to them as fast as possible. Okay, That's why we give them higher priority. But we don't want them to disturb the operating system. So how do you minimize the effect of all these interrupts uh, on the operating system timing how, how do you minimize all this right so the way you minimize them is by uh oh not this one the way you minimize them is by doing this right this is how you minimize so uh, that's why uh, rtos right handles interrupts using signals using signals Okay, so let's say now uh, you, you are running your operating system. You are running your operating system code. Pan SV handler, system handler, SVC handler, doesn't matter. Uh. When an interrupt comes along, a microcontroller interrupt, uh, you will perform automatic register stacking and then run that interrupt handler immediately because it has higher priority. So it runs immediately. Now, what happens when it runs immediately? You, you do this. Only this inside the interrupt handler, you don't have any ISR code because you want this interrupt handler to run and finish as soon as possible. Why you want this interrupt handler to run and finish as soon as possible? Because you don't want it to disturb the RTOS operation to minimize. So the only code you put here is OS signal set. You set a certain thread to run. So this certain thread uh, is where you put all the ISR code. So all the interrupt service routine code you don't put here, you transfer it to a special thread, right? This thread, uh, you go and wait to be signaled by this IRQ handler to run, right? So this is how we minimize, uh, we minimize the disturbance on the operating system, right? And yet that uh, you still have the highest, the fastest response to interrupts. The interrupt will respond immediately. Just that the interrupt handling code uh, may not run immediately, uh, but the processor has already registered that the interrupt has happened. Okay, right. So you may have many uh, interrupt levels of interrupt priority. So uh, if this one, if this interrupt is running, but then another interrupt comes along higher priority, then you need to do automatic register stacking again, nested interrupts. Uh, then this is a. Uh, this is a higher higher priority and so on until zero. Zero is the highest priority. Okay. Now zero, uh, although highest priority, uh, can still be interrupted by hard fault. The hard fault exception, which is minus one. And hard fault uh, can still be interrupted by NMI, non-maskable interrupt. Non-maskable interrupt, which is minus two. So nobody can disturb non-maskable interrupt already. Uh, because minus two is the highest. Okay. So this is how the main stack is used. This is the thread stack. So the thread stack, uh, let's say here there are three stacks. Uh, three, this, there are three uh, threads here. Example, three threads. So the thread stack is used to store the thread. Now, what is the thread stack it used to store? Okay. The thread stack uh, is used to store stack memory. All right. What is stack memory used for? Stack memory uh, is used to store number one the function's local variables. Let's say you, you declare a function, right? You, you declare a function, you know, like this. Uh, you declare a function. Uh, yeah, you declare a function, void thread one, void. You declare a function. So inside here, you go and put int u int 32. You put here x equals to zero, okay? So you see, uh, dot, dot, dot. you see, uh, we call this a global, uh, sorry, we call this a local variable. Local variable are variables that are declared inside a thread. So these local variables, uh, they are 
stored into the stack memory. Okay, and that is why uh, they have local scope. That is why we say that. Uh, that is why we say that. Uh, that is why we say that. Uh, uh, local variables, right? Local variables uh, have local scope. Local scope. That means uh, this variable x uh, can only be seen and accessed inside this function. So you can only access and use x uh, whenever you are running track one code. If you come out of track one, you run track two, for example, x is no longer accessible because you, you, you are using a different stack really. Right? You're not using this stack anymore. You change to a different stack. You know? So that's why we say local scope uh, as opposed to global variables. Global variables you declare outside functions, uh, they are accessible to everyone everywhere. We, we say global scope. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, now the stack uh, is used to store uh, local variables. It's also used for automatic uh, register stacking because uh, when you are running track code, uh, an interrupt can happen. All right. When you are running track code, uh, let's say you're running track code now. Uh, what happens when there is an interrupt? Before the processor runs the interrupt service routine, you need to save the thread's 16 CPU register values. You need to save the stack's CPU register values. Uh, uh, you, you need to save the thread's CPU register values into the stack, right? Before you uh, respond to the interrupt service routine. So, the first usage of the stack is to store local variables. The second usage is when interrupts happen, the register frame is stored in the stack. Uh, and you know which register frame we are talking about. Uh, we are talking about uh, this, this register frame. This register frame. All right. Just now I say 16. Uh, it's not 16. Uh, it's 8. 8 registers. So whenever uh, the interrupt happens, uh, before you run to the, before the processor jump to the interrupt service routine, the processor needs to save these eight registers into the stack first. So which stack? Uh, that thread's process stack. So if the thread is running now, right, the thread is running, uh, its process stack is used to store its local variables and also eight, regist eight CPU register values. If an interrupt happens before the processor jump to the ISR, it will save these eight CPU register values into the stack stack of that track. Okay? Right. Uh, where were we? Ah, here. And finally, uh, finally, uh, 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 oh, it's, it's not written here. It's, it's, not, it's written somewhere else. Never mind. And finally, uh, the, the last usage of the stack uh, for tracks uh, is to store the track contacts. So I come back here. Uh, Back here. So this one, track stack one, uh, here you store your local variables and also the register stack frame if an interrupt happens uh, before you jump to the interrupt service routine. Now, when you jump to the interrupt service routine, uh, interrupts or uh, use the main stack. Ah, you see, uh, you must be very clear on this. Uh, if we are running user code, user thread, when an interrupt happens, the registers are saved here. Right, the automatic register stacking is saved here into the thread stack. And then we jump to the interrupt service routine. Right? When we jump to the interrupt service routine, uh, we then switch to using the main stack already. Right? Interrupt handling uh, uses the main stack. So uh, if you are running the interrupt service routine, uh, if you are running the interrupt service routine and a higher priority interrupt comes, then you need to do stacking, right? Where is the stacking? It, it will be stacked into the main stack. Okay. So if you are inside the, if you are running interrupt service routine code, when a higher priority interrupt comes, interrupt nesting, then you will stack the registers again. No? At that time, you will be using the main stack already. Okay. So these threads uh, only do automatic register stacking one time, only one time. Here you can have many times like uh, if you have nested interrupts. Okay. All right. And then uh, now, after the thread runs until the end of its time slice, before the processor switch to another thread, you will need to save 
all the you need to save the 16 registers used by this thread. Okay, the 16 register values used by this thread, uh, it will be saved here. So here, 16 times 4 bytes, 64 bytes. Okay, the thread context uh, means the 16 CPU register values used by this thread, uh, 16 registers, 16 times 4 bytes, 64 bytes will be saved here. Okay, so this is the complete thread usage by each uh, thread. Uh, okay, now we, we have a method of detecting stack overflow. It is here. At the end, because your, your stack uh, is not infinite in size one, your stack, the size uh, is finite. Right? The size of your stack uh, is finite. You, can, you need to specify the size of your stack. When you do section B labs, uh, you will see how you can specify the size of your thread stack and your main stack. You can specify one in your configuration settings. You specify the size of the main stack and the size of the thread stack. So this size uh, is finite. If you exceed the size of the stack, uh, you will have stack overflow. Uh. Stack overflow will cause a lot of problems uh, and it's the most common uh, form of error, uh, stack overflow. So how do we prevent uh, damage, the code doing unpredictable stuff uh, because of stack overflow? We need to detect stack overflow occurring. How do we detect stack overflow occurring? Uh? Uh, the designers that put an overflow protect pattern at the end of the stack. Okay, overflow protect pattern at the end of the stack. Let me give you an example. Here, uh, I'm using the microvision, uh, the kill microvision memory watch window. I'm watching the contents of memory. Uh. So as you can see from here, uh, this is actually the stack of one thread. This is the stack of one thread. I zoom in a little bit. Right. This is the stack memory of one thread starting from here. Okay, so starting from here, uh, this is this blue color part uh, is the portion that have been used. How do we know that this is the portion that have been used? Uh? That's because uh, there is a watermark, a uh, magic pattern we call it. So the magic pattern or the watermark uh, is all C uh, C C C C C C. So you see here uh, is all C's. The operating system uh, when it starts up. Uh, it will, it will populate the entire stack memory of the thread with C's, all C. Okay, so uh, you, look, you look at the, if the C is still there, means it's not used yet. If the stack has written something in, uh, then it will overwrite the C already. Uh. So currently from here, uh, you can see that 32% uh, is used, the other 68% not yet used. Okay, and at the end of the stack, uh, you see here at the end of the stack, uh, this is the overflow protect pattern A5, 2E, 5A, E2. This is a special pattern. What's the, how is this pattern used? Whenever the operating sw system uh, switch from one thread to another, whenever the operating system switch from one thread to another, it will check the overflow protect pattern. So it will do this check uh, whenever it switch, switch. Okay, so it will check, is this pattern still there? If this pattern is still here, uh, means stack overflow didn't happen. But if this pattern is gone, uh, it has been overwritten by something else, uh, then you got stack overflow. Uh. Okay? And I tell you, uh, it's almost impossible for this overflow protect pattern to, to be overwritten with the same value. Uh. So in case you're thinking of that, uh, it's not possible. Uh, right? it's, it's, not, it's almost impossible uh, to coincidentally uh, stack overflow and you overwrite the overflow protect pattern back with the overflow protect pattern, uh, that is, will probably not happen. Uh. If it happens, then you will, you will hit the 100D lottery. Uh, you know? Not 6D lottery, a uh, 100D lottery. Okay, so this is how you, uh, this is how the operating system protects against overflow protect pattern. Uh. And you see, uh, I show you something very interesting. I show you something very interesting. So you see here, uh, you see here, uh, so the RTOS stores this overflow protect pattern uh, at the stack bottom, right? Okay, this is used by the kernel uh, to check for stack overflow. Uh. So the kernel runs every system tick. Every system tick, uh, the kernel runs. It will check for stack overflow. Uh. And if stack overflow is detected, uh, now this will probably happen. Uh. It may happen. So I tell you first uh, what you will see when it happens. Now, how, how does it happen? It happens uh, if... Uh, Usually, uh, not usually, uh, by default, uh, 
by default, uh, the thread stack size is 200 bytes. By default, the thread stack size is 200 bytes. If you go and declare an array in your thread, if you go and declare an array here uh, in your thread, uh, you go and do something like this. Uh, very easy one. You just do something like this. You just do something like this. That's all you need to do. Okay, that's all you need to do. So if you do something like this, uh, means uh, you are declaring uh, an array, uh, you are creating an array uh, 50 times 4 bytes. 50 times 4 bytes. Because this is 4 bytes, uh, 50 times 4 bytes uh, is already 200 bytes. So uh, on top of the other stuff, uh, so you have stack overflow already. If you do something like this, uh, then you have stack overflow. Now you don't know one, you don't know. So when you run your code, what happens? When you run your simulator, right? Then your program uh, seems to hang already. Uh. Then before you WhatsApp me and ask me why your program hang already, uh, you go and you go and uh, see uh, where your program is stuck at. Because when you run the simulator, the simulator will run, then it will be stuck somewhere. You, you stop your simulator and you see where your program execution is at. If your program execution is inside this function. Void OS error. This is an operating system function. Uh. If it's inside this function, uh, that means you have stack overflow. Okay, then you need to, you have a few options. Either you remove the offending uh, array or you can increase the size of your stack. Okay, uh, I would suggest that you, re you remove the array uh, because that is not a proper way of doing things. Uh. If you want memory, uh, if you want a lot of memory to do some stuff, uh, don't use don't do something like this. What should you do? Uh? Use the, anyone can guess it? Use the memory pool. That's what it's used for. Okay. If the thread, uh, you need a lot of, uh, you need some memory to do some calculation, uh, right? Don't go and create an array inside your thread. Just go and get some uh, memory from the memory pool. Then you have to create the memory pool and set the size correctly uh, and then you just grab the memory from the memory pool from for whatever purpose after you're done you free it back okay so that's the appropriate mechanism uh, for using mem for using a lot of memory uh. okay so all right now so you see uh, the stack is the stack is uh, very important stack overflow is the most common type of error how do we prevent stack overflow we have to size our stack correctly. So here I have two examples. I have two examples here, how you size your stack uh, correctly. We have two methods. We have two methods to calculate required stack size. Now you have to calculate what is the required stack size and then go and set your stack size correctly. Lah. So how do you calculate? We have two methods, static and dynamic. Static, uh, you just need to build your program. You just need to build your program. When you build your programmer, uh, you just enable this call graph. Enable the call graph when you build your program. Before you press the build button, make sure you take this, enable the call graph. What's the call graph? The call graph uh, is the HTML file. Uh. It contains uh, the maximum, uh, it will tell you the maximum stack size uh, used by each function. The maximum stack size used by each function. Okay, because every function got local variables. Man. So uh, this is the maximum depth of the call chain. Call chain. Phase A function will call this function. This function call this function. This function call this function. This function calls this function and call this function and finally end with this function. So this maximum depth of call chain uh, will result in stack usage maximum of 264 bytes. Maximum. Uh, okay. So you can estimate uh, the stack size required uh, using static analysis by referring to the call graph. But what is the disadvantage? What is the disadvantage uh, of using uh, this static, static, static stack analysis? The disadvantage is uh, the disadvantage is uh, most importantly uh, is the call graph uh, doesn't take into account the memory space for thread stack switching and automatic register stacking. Why? Why? Because uh, the thread stack switching uh, 
and the automatic register stacking uh, this only happen when you run the program uh. if you do static analysis or you never run the program or you don't know the runtime memory requirements so you have after you get your call graph your static stack analysis or uh, you have to manually add in the memory required for thread stack switching and automatic register stacking uh. you have to add this in okay but what is the advantage of static analysis so uh, static analysis disadvantage is you cannot find the things that happen during runtime uh. but what's the advantage the advantage is uh, you get the worst case worst case uh, worst case isr nesting that means uh, let's say your system got 10 interrupts let's say your system got 10 interrupts what is the possibility of all 10 interrupts happening at the same time almost impossible uh. rarely occur when you are testing uh. so you will never find the case where all 10 interrupts happen at the same time during testing that is not to say it's safer uh, because uh, if you deploy your system in to the customer you sell to the customer already one fine day uh, one customer uh, he will trigger all interrupts to happen at the same time then his system will crash now what if that system uh, is a car automobile control system or an aircraft control system then people will die uh, you know so uh, you must take this into account right so what is the now static stack analysis uh, it can give you the worst case isr nesting worst case all 10 interrupts happening at the same time which dynamic stack analysis doesn't give you so dynamic stack analysis uh, will tell you how much stack you use by running the program uh, so this one you don't need to run the program right so this one uh, dynamic stack analysis it runs the program it runs the program and tell you how much stack is being used but the disadvantage of dynamic stack analysis is it, it cannot tell you the worst case isr nesting la, right? because you cannot get all the interrupts to happen at the same time when you're running the program la. under normal test condition is difficult la. okay all right so let's see uh, uh, let's see how they are used i give you an example now i give you an example let's look at this example now. okay so let's look at this example uh. So we will stop after this example, uh, don't worry. All right, um, we are using the LPC1768. Okay, so you got dynamic analysis and you got static analysis, two analysis. So dynamic analysis tell you the, the results are slightly different. Uh. So which one should you use? The worst case one, right? For example, if you see here, uh, low priority track, 96 bytes, low priority track, uh, dynamic analysis, Low priority track give you 96. Static, low priority track give you 72. Which one should you use? Use the 96. Or always use the larger number. Okay, the worst case one. All right. So now the question is de determine the timer track stack size and the track stack size. So the timer track, uh, OS RTX timer track. Timer track is 112. This one uh, is 104. Which one should we use? 112. We use 112. Uh, and then the default track stack size. I got low priority, normal priority, high priority. Got three. 96, 72, 88. Because all my tracks use a default, default stack size. Ma. So I should find the largest one. Who is the largest? 96. Okay. So track is 96. Timer track is uh, 112. Uh. Now I need to add some stuff. What should I add? What should I add? You need to add 64 bytes. You need to add 64 bytes. Why is this? Where is this 64 bytes? The track switching? Track switching. Right? Track switching. So your um your track uh, uses maximum 96. Oh. You have to add another 16 for track switching. Okay. Uh then so you get 160. Uh. Now timer is 112, you add 64, you get 176. Is that the final number? No, you still need to add, you still need to add uh, an extra eight bytes. Because the overflow protect pattern uses four bytes and double word stack alignment, your stack must always be aligned to an address divisible by eight. Okay, double word stack alignment. Your stack uh, must always start at an address divisible by eight. So you need to you might need to add padding of four bytes. So add eight. So 160 plus eight is uh, 168, 176 plus eight is 184. Okay, so worst case track is 168. Worst case timer track is 184 bytes, right? This is how you calculate. Uh. And we, we got 200, uh. default is 200, so okay, uh, no problem. 200 is fine. Okay, 
how about how about the main main this is the user tracks process stack huh? how about the main how about the main stack size okay so in this example we look at the this example uh, is to calculate the main stack just now that example is process stack thread stack this one is main stack main stack so main stack is to store the operating system huh? so now let's see let's look at the operating system stack requirements okay we are using the uh, RTX kernel. The RTX kernel got different size one. Why? Because optimization. You got different optimization setting. Uh. Zero means lowest for debugging purpose. Uh. One, two, three. Three is the highest optimization, resulting in the smallest possible code. What do we mean by optimization? When you press the build button, uh, your compiler will convert your C program to assembly. Right? Your compiler uh, will convert your C program to assembly. So maximum optimization means minimum uh, assembly code generated. So you have minimum uh, memory requirements. Huh? Okay. So uh, this is the different optimization level and the different uh, memory requirements for the kernel. Now, the, the event recorder uh, is, some, is a special program uh, that will give you a lot of uh, debug information. Uh, but to, to add this special program, uh, you need more memory. Okay, so what do we what do we need now? Uh, what do we need? Okay, here. Uh, assume the lowest optimization level zero uh, No optimization and uh, no event recorder. So lowest optimization level, no event recorder. How much we need? How much we need? Lowest optimization level, no event recorder. So we need one seven six. Okay. So KIB, keep this in mind. Uh, our kernel is one seven six uh. Okay. Then let's see here. Uh, here we got uh we got three interrupts external interrupt three timer zero and timer one let's zoom in a little bit zoom in a little bit here okay so external interrupt three uses 18 bytes uh, sorry stack size is zero bytes timer zero uses 12 bytes timer one uses 120 bytes so this is the stack size uh, all right for these three handlers Okay, and uh, your main uh, startup code, uh, main or your startup code uses eight bytes. Okay, so let's calculate the main stack size now. So we come here, uh, we look at this. Okay, this is your main, your main stack size. Okay, All right. So this is the main stack, main stack. Uh. now when you turn on the microcontroller, or uh, when you turn on the microcontroller, the startup code will run. Startup code will run. So the startup code uh, uses how many? Startup code uses how many? Startup code uses how many? So your startup code uses startup code uses eight, right? Your main function uh, uses eight bytes. Eight bytes. Okay. So here, startup code uses eight. But why forty uh? Why got forty here? Uh? Startup code only use eight, right? Why got 40? Uh, one moment there. Uh. Okay, sorry, that was an alarm. All right, uh, so startup code uh, uses eight bytes. But as you know, uh, the startup code after it runs, uh, you then run the kernel, and the kernel runs using exception handlers. So the startup code uh, needs to store the automatic register stacking before you can run the kernel because the kernel is entirely in exception handlers. Man. So before the, the, the startup code uh, can go to the kernel, you need to save the eight uh, registers into the stack. So that's why we have eight times four is 32, right? Eight times four is 32. Uh. So your startup code, eight bytes plus 32 for automatic register stacking, you get 40. Right, so startup code uses 40. Then we go to the kernel. Okay, how much memory does the kernel use? 176. This one you know already, 176. Huh? And then the kernel uh, may be disturbed by timer one interrupt, which has higher priority. Lah. So if it's disturbed, uh, then 176, you need to plus 32. Automatic register stacking, 32. 176 plus 32 is 208. Okay, then we run the timer one uh, handler. 
Now the Timer 1 handler uh, uses Timer 1 handler uses 120 bytes of stack. 120 bytes. So Timer 1 uses 120. Timer 1, uh, you see the group priority? Timer 1 is group priority is 1. Timer 0 has higher group priority. So Timer 0 can preempt Timer 1. Uh. Timer 0 can preempt Timer 1. Where is the group priority? Eh, just now here. Here, you are given the group priority and the sub priority, ma, right? Okay. So, uh, timer one, timer one has higher priority than timer. Is, uh, sorry, timer zero has higher priority than timer one. So, timer zero can preempt timer one. If it preempts, oh, okay, then one twenty. You need to automatic stacking thirty two. One twenty plus thirty two is one five two. Okay, one five two. Then you run timer zero. Timer zero is sixteen. Timer zero can be interrupted by uh, external interrupt tree, you know, can or not, cannot. Why? Uh? Because they have the same group priority. Okay, they have the same group priority. Now this, there's a typo here. Uh. There is a typo here. There's a typo. This one should be, this one should be white color. This one should be zero. Uh. Is zero, ah? Uh. Right. This is zero, ah, uh. because you can see from here. I don't know why there's a four there. You see, external interrupt tree stack size kosong zero. Okay, external interrupt tree, ah, uh, the stack size is zero, zero. So this is zero, ah. Uh. So you see here, ah. Uh, Timer zero and external interrupt three, uh, they have the same priority, so they cannot preempt. Uh. So who use more memory? Timer zero, 16. Okay. And timer zero can be preempted by hard fault. Hard fault got higher priority. Uh. So if it's preempted, uh, so 16 plus 32 is 48. Then the hard fault runs. Hard fault uh, not given, so we just assume zero. Uh. Hard fault can be preempted by NMI. Uh. So hard fault, if it's preempted by NMI, it will, it will stack 32. And then NMI runs off. NMI cannot be preempted already, so no need to count anymore. Therefore, the total total main stack size is 40 plus 208 plus 152 plus 48 plus 32 is 480. 480. Okay, so this is how you uh, this is how you uh, estimate the main stack size. Okay. Right, so we have talked about the uh, control register and the stack already. So we, we will continue the discussion uh, of the remaining part of this lecture in our next uh, review. Uh, in our next review. Okay, so and also the quiz time uh, we will discuss in the next review. Uh, right. Okay, uh, do you have any questions before we stop here for today? Uh, is everyone okay? Do you have any questions before we stop here for today? Oh, okay. No problem, sir. Oh, by the way, I just want to check. Oh, uh, when when I'm because because I talk uh quite fast and I move around quite fast. Oh, uh, any of any one of you, um. Uh, experience any lagging uh, during our classes when I'm talking? Uh, do, you, do you experience any lagging or it's okay, very smooth? That means uh, you didn't miss any, any word that I say and the screen doesn't jump. Okay, yeah. Uh. Okay, all right. So if, if any of you experience any uh, lagging, uh, all right, that means... Uh, Maybe you cannot hear my words sometimes on and off, and then my screen is not moving. Uh, please let me know. Uh. Please immediately let me know. Then I will stop for a while. Okay. All right. So uh, we will stop here for today. Okay. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. See you in the next class. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Uh? Chu Zhang Hing. 
Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Zhang Hing Chu. Uh, okay, um, now if you want to have a recording, uh, uh, you can record uh, because the, the person who can get the recording is normally the first person who log into the, the first person who log into the class. And I think uh, normally uh, you guys log in before me. Right? I log in at exactly the start of the class. I think you guys log in maybe a few minutes before the class start. Uh. So the person who has the recording function, uh, uh, I don't think I have the recording function. The person who has the recording function is the one that comes in first one. Here's my function. Uh, I don't have the recording function here, you see. So uh, whoever come in first, right, the first person who joined, uh, that person can record. Uh, and then after he record, uh, then you can share with the rest of the class. Uh, right? What I can see is that the recording function uh, is only available to the, the first person who joined the, the class. Student account cannot record. Huh? Are you sure? Uh, I don't think so. Huh? Um, wait, huh? Let's see. I don't have the recording function. Or okay, you can use a, you can use a. I think the meeting organization for calendar could post no limited for lecture. Oh, I see. Yeah, you are right. You are right. Uh, if you organize through the calendar, can uh, Or how about that? Uh, how about uh, if you want to have the recording right now actually uh, the, the reason why i didn't have recording of the one hour class uh, is because actually the one hour class uh, is not a lecture right the, the lecture uh, is in the lecture videos so this one hour class uh, is actually not a lecture it's supposed to be a discussion session that means uh, i ask you okay you guys watch the video already oh so where do you want to talk about uh, then we start talking uh. so it's a uh, Discussion session, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be a lecture. I, mean, I keep talking, but then you see that like, somehow it ended because you didn't ask me questions. Uh, then I just go on and on and on and on. Uh, in any case, uh, actually, uh, what the things that I have said right just now uh, is all inside the lecture videos. That is why I didn't record this uh, session, just like I don't record the tutorials and the labs because all those materials I have is already in the videos or the lab manuals. Okay, so if you want to record, right, you can just do a screen recording. Right? If any of you want to record, you can just do a screen recording. Right, but anyway, anyway, what I said during our one hour class, there is nothing new. It's actually a condensed version. I actually talk about the same thing in much more detail in the lecture videos. Right. I actually talk way, way much more details in lecture videos. Huh? So that's why you should watch the lecture videos. And then uh, during the review, the, this one hour class, uh, we, we actually talk about the things that you don't understand in lecture videos. I hope that that would be the case uh, in the future classes. Huh? Right. Yeah. Uh, now, actually, uh, the poor network law, uh, uh, I think uh, what I experienced is uh, my, my internet here is quite fast. I'm using a uh, fiber optic unify. I have about 20 megabits, 20 megabits per second. I have 20 megabytes. My speed is about 20 megabytes per second, up to 20 megabytes per second, which is about, which is about 20 times eight, uh, about 160 megabits per second. So 
from my side, uh, the data coming out are uh, definitely no problem one. Right? So any problem, uh, it will be in your, your site when you're receiving it, or it's the Google server problem. Right? So poor network problem can be easily addressed, which is why I say uh, when, when you hear me stuttering, uh, uh, you, just, you just do this. Right? Just raise your hand. Right? You just raise your hand, and then uh, uh, you raise. I know you've this before. So you just raise your hand and let me know, uh, then I'll repeat. Right, because it's. I hope that our one hour class is not a one way delivery. La. I keep talking, you just listen. I hope that it's a discussion. La. Because if it's a discussion, la, then you learn more. You know? Because I know what you don't understand, then I can tell you more on those parts. Right? So hopefully, la, more of a two way discussion la, during our class. La. Because this, this is not a lecture, actually, it's a review. Lecture is all in the lecture videos. Okay? Right, uh, any case, la, uh, I think no need to record this one hour because. It's just a repeat of what you have in lecture videos. Okay, uh, right, that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that's all. Right, see you in the next class.